Hello everybody, happy Wednesday. And man, a lot has happened since our last update uh, over the weekend. On Saturday, just a few hours after I made that update, the war between Israel and Hezbollah underwent an uptick of epic proportions. For the Israeli Air Force launched more missions and sorties on that one day than it ever had in all of its history of all of its wars, launching about 1,100 attacks on just as many targets of Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, aimed mostly at their arms and weapons caches that that organization had been accumulating for over the past decade. In fact, Israel's war plan against Hezbollah has been well in the making since its last war against that organization in 2006. And Saturday's Israeli attack on Hezbollah positions showed in epic proportions just how much planning Israel had been doing for at least the last 10 years uh, in anticipation for a war against Hezbollah. And in fact, all of the commentators in Israel have been uh, observing and commenting how it puts in stark contrast with the lack of preparations that Israel had for a war against Hamas in Gaza. The intelligence gathered by Israel for over the last decade related to Hezbollah and its accumulation of weapons and storing them in individuals' homes throughout the country has just been done on a vast scale. And therefore, the attack that Israel uh, executed on Saturday uh, was of such, not just magnitude, but of unprecedented precision. Now, some people have estimated that with that one attack on Saturday, Israel has eliminated something uh, like 50%, 5-0, 50% of Hezbollah's uh, rocket and missiles supplies or uh, arms cache. Again, I always try to err towards the minimalist view. I'd rather be caught understating something than exaggerating something. There seems to be more honor in being an, an understater than there is uh, being an overstater. I tend to side with those that would say that that's an exaggeration, that it's true that Israel's attack on Saturday and attacks since Saturday have greatly uh, impeded or hurt Hezbollah and their war aims and war effort, knocking out not just their arm caches and supplies, but since uh, a couple months ago, Israel has succeeded one by one to eliminate the upper echelon of Hezbollah's command structure, its war council, or what Hezbollah calls more specifically its jihad council. Uh, and just in the last few days, uh, Israel has succeeded uh, to eliminate Hezbollah's number two and three in command. And therefore, the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, is now basically left alone and has been depicted in some uh, political satire, cartoons in Israeli newspapers, as sitting in uh, his boardroom around the table of advisors that would normally be advising and counseling him on uh, the next decisions of war making and all of them have been eliminated. He's left virtually by himself. And then of course, there was that amazing pager attack, which by Hezbollah's own confession that just came out in the last couple of days has removed at least 1,500 of their personnel and fighters from their front lines. So a ton has happened since Saturday. And yet this episode is not about that. I've decided to take a break from the war and begin the series that I promise called Making Sense of the End Times. But before I even get into the scriptures in this new series, Making Sense of the End Times, I need to set the stage. I need to set the context. I need to present the uh, history that leads up 
to these times that we call the end times, and I need to present the cast of characters, both the heroes or the protagonists and the villains or the antagonists. And I've decided to begin with this first volume in the series of setting the stage for the series with the first Judean war against the Romans that broke out in the year 66 AD under the reign of Nero. Now in 66 AD, Nero himself, uh, who by all accounts had something missing up here, he was sort of a crazy guy. In 66 AD, Nero is touring the Greek world, he's left the city of Rome and the empire in the hands of one of his freedmen or former slaves, while he himself, Nero, is going from town to town performing in Greek theaters as an actor slash comedian slash musician playing his fiddle or the lyre uh, before gawking audiences. And while he's on this entertainment tour, entertaining the masses with his comedy and his acting and his showmanship. War breaks out in 66 AD between uh, the Judeans and the Romans. Now, the war is called in Hebrew, Hamered Hagadol, the Great Revolt. But the chief historian of that war, a guy by the name of Flavius Josephus, who's our main source for this war, he names it in Latin, Bellum Judaicum, which means the war of the Jews, according to some people, but I favor the war of the Judeans. Now I gave a whole teaching and I really recommend and implore that you go back to view this teaching. It's one of my earliest teachings of this YouTube channel and therefore only a couple hundred people watched it as I had a small audience. But the name of the teaching is, did the Jews, in quotes, kill Christ? Which Jews, in quotes? In other words, uh, I give a lesson on how the Greek word eudaios can mean either a Jewish person by faith, in other words, a person who uh, subscribes to the Jewish faith, or worships as a Jewish person, or it can mean a citizen or resident of the region called Judea. And I use that teaching to try to put in context how the New Testament uses the word eudaios, how many English translators of the New Testament prefer to always, without exception, translate the word as Jew, where I argue in that video that it would be more appropriate in some contexts to translate that word as Judean as opposed to say a Galilean and not just a, a member of the Jewish faith. In other words, the Greek word eudaios can mean many things, sometimes a member of the Jewish religion, but often actually, I would say more often in the New Testament, a citizen or resident of the district known as Judea as opposed to the district known as Galilee. Uh, well, likewise with the Roman word that I just used, bellum judaicum, that last word uh, can mean the Jewish people or it can mean Judea. Some people prefer to call that war, therefore, the war of the Jews uh, against Rome. I prefer to refer to it as the Judean war, the war between Judea and Rome, and it was our first war as the Judean slash Jewish people against the Roman Empire. We fought three wars against them. Now that first war, as I said, began under the reign of Nero while he was off playing the fiddle in the cities of Greece. Uh, and he sends his general Vespasian to subdue the Jewish people. The war of broke out for several reasons. Part of it had to do with the uh, abuses, uh, if you will, of successive Roman governors that were sent to rule Judea. There was also religious tension between the Jews and Rome, the Jews accusing the Roman authorities of lacking sensitivity towards Jewish customs and practices and worship on the Temple Mount. 
Uh, so that was a reason. There was also a growing gap between the haves and have-nots within Judea itself. In other words, a growing gap between the elite and wealthy Jews of Judea versus the masses, uh, the poor underclass masses. Okay, so that was a reason. And all this exploded in the year 66 AD. And Vespasian is sent to uh, crush this rebellion. Now, the war takes four years to ultimately be crushed. It's crushed in the year 70 AD in the Jewish month of Av with the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. Now, some of you have heard of the Hebrew fast that takes place every year on the 9th of Av, which commemorates the destruction of both our historical temples. The first temple destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The second temple destroyed by Titus, the son of Vespasian, who I just mentioned. Neither temple was destroyed exactly on the 9th of Av, but I was taught back as a student at Hebrew University that one of those temples was destroyed on the 8th of Av, the other temple was destroyed on the 10th of Av, and the 9th of Av was just founded as a convenient uh, day between those two destructions to commemorate the destruction of both of those temples, okay? So the 9th of Av commemorates the destruction of both Solomon's temple and Herod's temple destroyed by Titus, son of Vespasian. Vespasian himself had become an emperor following Nero during the war itself against the Jews. So he hands a baton to his son Titus and his son Titus destroys the temple, which was one of the most calamitous events to ever befall the Jewish people. In fact, one of my professors at Hebrew University said that until the Holocaust, the most calamitous day to ever befall the Jewish people was the destruction of our temple in 70 AD. And in fact, the Jewish religion had to reinvent itself following the destruction of that temple. Why? Because Judaism in biblical times at its heart was centered on a sacrificial system on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. It was the central cult of Judaism. Now, when I say the word cult, I don't mean that in the way that many of us uh, relate to the word cult. I'm not talking about the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, or or the guy who led, what was his name, Jim Jones, who led the people out in Ghana, or whatever the name of this country was, who all drank the proverbial cool aid and committed suicide. When I use the word cult in the realm of religious studies, it refers to that central ritual of a religion. So the central cult of biblical Judaism is the temple mount and its sacrificial system. Uh, likewise, the central cult to Catholicism would be its Eucharist uh, and mass uh, daily service. That's the central rite of the Catholic religion or in the parlance of religious studies, the central cult. When Judaism's central cult was destroyed in 70 AD, it had to reinvent itself as a religion. And therefore, modern day Judaism, and I'll dedicate other episodes to this, this isn't the place to talk at length at this, but I still have to mention it. Modern day Judaism is a response to two traumas or uh, two obstacles in Jewish history. The first one won't surprise most of you who come from Christian backgrounds, and that is Jesus's messianic claims. Judaism would go on to reject Jesus as the Messiah. Many Jews received and accepted him as the Messiah, but the remainder and majority did not. And therefore this posed a problem. What does the Jewish community do with the Jesus issue or the Jesus problem? And this was compounded 40 years later by the destruction of the central rite or cult of Judaism, our temple on the Temple Mount. And Judaism therefore had to come up, uh, revamp itself to deal with these two traumas. What do we do with the Christianity's Jesus claims? And what do we do with the fact that now our central rite, our central ritual, uh, in which according to the Bible, the very 
Forgiveness and redemption from sins is prosecuted or executed each day and each year on the day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. What do we do in lieu of that temple? Well, we revamp the religion of Judaism to answer those two questions. Now, what was Judaism's answer to those two questions? Well, I'm not going to get to it in this episode. It would far exceed the parameters of the series making sense of the end times, but I'll address that in other episodes going forward. So temples destroyed in 70 AD, but now we have to deal with certain myths. The myth number one is that the Romans are said to have expelled the Jews from the country following their defeat and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That is false. And in fact, Jews would remain the majority population of the country until about 800 AD. It wouldn't be for another 800 years that the Jews would finally be reduced to a minority in our own land. That's very important. And that's the main myth. I said it was myth number one, but it's going to be the only myth that I debunk at the moment. So, did the Romans expel all the Jewish people from Judea following our first war against them between the years 66 and 73 AD? Now, I said the war reaches climax in 70 AD with the destruction of our temple. That's true, but the war didn't come to its full end until that final battle at Masada. And those of you that have been with me on tour of Israel, I've heard me give the full story of Masada at the site, which remains to this day one of the most spectacular sites in the country. It was at Masada that the war finally comes to an end with the mass suicide of the fighters up at Masada. And that's it for that first war, the first of our three wars against the Roman Empire. Now, there was a second Jewish war against the Roman Empire that took place between the years 115 and 117 AD. It's called the Revolt of the Diaspora, for it's not the Jews living in Judea that wage this war or rebellion against the Romans, but rather the Jews scattered abroad, particularly in the eastern Mediterranean uh, places of Egypt, Cyprus, and Libya. And uh, this revolt took place, as I said, between 115 and 117 AD during the reign of Trajan. And he's important because under Trajan's reign, the Roman Empire is at its apex, the strongest it's ever been, and covers the most territory it ever has in its history. And this revolt takes place under Trajan's reign while he is off fighting a war in what today is called Iraq or ancient Mesopotamia. And that revolt is crushed as well. It, By the way, it's a revolt that we know the least about of the three. Uh, we don't know all the reasons for it. It's been suggested that part of it was a leftover chip on the shoulder and bitterness over the destruction of our temple in the previous war in 70 AD. Uh, it's been explained also as being a revolt against a tax that the Romans imposed following that first revolt called the Fiscus Judaicus which uh, is basically the Jews up until the destruction of our temple in 70 AD would pay each year a half shekel tax towards the upkeep of that temple. When the Romans destroy the temple, they command that now the Jews have to give each year that same one half shekel tax to the Roman coffers or the coffers of their God, Jupiter. Now, that, of course, is adding great insult to injury that the Jews are now forced to pay a tax to the Roman cult, okay, and to the cult of, uh, to Jupiter, okay, to a foreign deity here. And it's believed that maybe that's what caused this rebellion in the diaspora, again, in, uh, where uh, the Jews were living in Egypt, Libya, and Cyprus. Whatever the reason, okay, and it's said to have also included some messianic uh, passions 
uh, this Jewish yearning and belief that the messianic uh, reign was about to come and rescue us from all of our travails. Whatever the reason, the revolt happened and the Romans crush it by the year 117 AD. Now, this is where it gets really interesting and really important for setting the stage to this study of making sense of the end times. For in the year 132 AD, we the Jews rebel against Rome a third time. And this is the most important perhaps of all of these rebellions for setting the stage of the end times. It's called the Bar Kokhba revolt because it was led in part by a spiritual leader of sorts named Bar Kokhba, okay, a guy who evidently had messianic claims or, or his followers at least believed him to be the Messiah. And why did this war break out in 132 AD is very interesting. The emperor Hadrian, the emperor at the time, is touring the Roman world between the years 129 and 130 AD. And on the tour of his Roman dominion, he comes to Judea. He comes to Jerusalem, and this is almost 50 years after the city had been destroyed by Titus. The city and temple had been destroyed. And Hadrian declares what he plans to do with Jerusalem. He plans to turn it into a Roman colony called Aelia Capitolina. Now that's important because Aelia is the surname of Hadrian's family, or Gens in Latin, G-E-N-S, Gens, or uh, family. And Capitolina is the name of Jupiter. Okay, Jupiter Capitolinus is the chief deity of the Roman world. And they believe it's he who vanquished the Jewish God, Yahweh, back in 70 AD. After all, the Romans destroyed Yahweh's temple. And in their eyes, that makes their God, Jupiter, his superior. So in celebration of the destruction of Jerusalem's temple 50 years prior, Hadrian decides to rename the city after his god Jupiter and himself, his family name. So he combines his surname with the name of Jupiter and therefore the city is to be called Aelia Capitolina. Aelia is Hadrian's surname, Capitolina, as in the god Jupiter, who's housed on the Capitoline Hill of Rome. And not only that, but Hadrian decides to build a shrine to his god Jupiter on the ruins of Yahweh's house on the Temple Mount. And this causes the Jews to rebel in a third war. It would sort of be our version of, for lack of a better word, I got to take it from Arabic, jihad. Now, Judaism has this principle called uh, Kiddush Hashem, to die to sanctify the name of Yahweh. Uh, in other words, Jews are expected, if not outright commanded, to die when confronted with certain things, which would be uh, the, the forbidding of us to carry out our religion, Okay, the forbidding of us, say, to get circumcised or to or, or a war on the very existence of the Jews would require that we fight a holy war of such for our very existence. And it's called euphemistically dying for Kiddush Hashem, dying to sanctify the name of our God, Yahweh. And Hadrian's decrees to change the name of the city, but more specifically to build a shrine to Jupiter on the remains of Yahweh's house can, was considered by a critical mass of Jews to be something worth dying for. In other words, dying Kiddush Hashem to sanctify the name of our God, Yahweh. And therefore we launch a third war against the Romans. Now, we fought with such tenacity and conviction in that war that the Romans were required to relocate one third of their entire military. Legions were brought from Germany and from England and from France and were redeployed to take on little Judea, which was 
nothing but a speck within the whole Roman world, but we fought with such tenacity for the honor of our religion and our God that it, it required of the Romans one third of their entire military, about 10 legions to come and crush that revolt and crush it they did. And it's presumed or believed that they killed between half a million and 600,000 Jews. Now, there are some Jews who in history refer to that as the first Holocaust of the Jews. To me, that's a little bit melodramatic and the word Holocaust should probably be reserved just for the Holocaust, but it was a mass killing of Jews, again, between 500 and 600,000 Jews. And certain punishments were decreed for these Judean Jewish troublemakers. One of the punishments was that the Jews were to be expelled now for the first time from Judea on pain of death. They were not allowed to live in Jerusalem or its environs. It would probably include Bethlehem nearby as well. Not expelled from the whole country of what today is called Israel, but expelled from that central heartland called Judea. And thereafter, the Jews would relocate to the Galilee. The Galilee would now become the central location of the Jewish population of what today we call Israel. But again, it's not until about 800 AD that the Jewish people lose our majority in the land that today we call Israel. That's important and I wanna repeat that as I did earlier. So the Jews are expelled by Hadrian from Jerusalem on pain of death. Any Jew caught coming back to the city can be killed on the spot. And, and it's very important, you need to remember that for a future, the next episode actually. And a second punishment decreed upon the Jewish people is that Hadrian changes the name of the country from Judea, which means in Latin, land of the Jews, to Syria, Palestina. There's that name for the first time in history, Palestina, Palestina in Latin means the land of the Philistines. And he does this in order to eviscerate or disassociate the Jewishness of the land from the land itself. In other words, change the name from land of the Jews to the land of the Philistines in order to pry away or erase the whole Jewish connection with the land. And I'll argue that every single person or entity that has chosen to call the land of Israel by the name Palestine since Hadrian is calling it by that name Palestine for the very same reason, to disassociate or destroy the Jewish connotations and connections with the country. That too is very important for this series that we're beginning today, making sense of the end times. So. Since Hadrian's decree in 136 AD, the name of the region has been called by the enemies of the Jews to this very day, Palestine. He's the one that started that tradition. Okay, so on pain of death, Jews can no longer live in the heartland of the country, but have to relocate to the Galilee. And the name of the country is changed from Judea to Syria, Palestina or Palestine. Now, I think that's where I'm gonna cut off this episode. I try to keep these episodes short to hopefully no longer than 15 to 20 minutes. In the next episode of Setting the Stage for Making Sense of the End Times, I'll introduce to you the Muslims, their conquering of the country, uh, and who in the world are these so-called Palestinians? When and how and by what means are they birthed into this story? Okay, because there is no record of a Palestinian people at all, preceding, let's say, at the earliest, maybe 1921. So I'm going to pick up this story in the next episode of the series. I'm not saying in the next episode because in the next episode, I will likely do another war update to make sense of everything that's happening with the war with Hezbollah. But in the next episode of this series, Making Sense of the End Times, 
I'm now going to introduce the next characters to be considered, and that's the Muslims and the Palestinians. So until then, be blessed. This is Steve, the tour guide, signing off and wishing you a phenomenal day. See you in a few more. Bye-bye.